Good evening, everybody. My name is Matthew Ogden. I'm an editor with LaRouchePack.com. I'd like to welcome all of you watching to tonight's uh, live webcast from LaRouche Pack TV. Uh, tonight's webcast will feature Mr. Lyndon LaRouche. This is our regular Friday night broadcast. Today is January 18th, 2013. Uh, the discussion we're having tonight is going to be very significant. Uh, Mr. Uh, LaRouche is joined by Jason Ross and Dennis Mason tonight in the studio, and we will follow our usual format. So uh, I thank you for tuning in tonight, and uh, I am proud to give you Mr. Lyndon LaRouche. It is now under to be understood that we are reaching the climactic point in this new term of the presidency. Uh, there are cer certain things that are generally understood, especially by more well-informed people and thinking people, but there are some other things that have to be taken up, and I shall take up some of these tonight in these remarks now. The usual, the pro most of the discussion comes now on the question of money. And unfortunately, what most people think about money is in one sense or another wrong, even absurd. The, the general assumption is that there's something magical about money inherently, which, uh, on which we are supposed to depend. I look at this money, and it's on the one hand, it's paper, a special kind of paper, but it's paper. And you can put the denomination of the paper on the bill, and you can be $100, it could be $1,000, it could be $5, whatever you want. What makes this stuff worth anything? It's simply a, like a message, a note, a promissory note, isn't it? That's all it is. Now we have some other kinds of money, copper, silver, gold, platinum. All of these are forms of money. Now they have, these have, do have some intrinsic value in them because you could take the platinum and you can sell it as platinum for the amount of purity and weight of the platinum. You can do the same thing with gold and so forth and so on. So, but what, what's this meaning? Why are we so excited about printing a few notes or weaving them or whatever else you do and saying this has value? Why are you so hot up about money? Because intrinsically, except for the metallic forms of money, which is not only money, its value lies not in the fact that it's money. The value lies in the fact that it's a metal which has some, some value in, intrinsically as the use value. So the, the one wonders now, since we're on the verge of the highest rate of inflation in U.S. history, that's what's about to happen. We have a similar situation in Europe. It's also a panic situation. And it's beginning to creep in on China and will creep in on India and elsewhere. So what is what is all money mean? What is it? What does it mean? How does it affect us? Here we, we're on the edge of some disaster that's going to occur to us based on money. But money has no intrinsic value except in, let's, in the metallic form. Even the metallic form is not really intrinsic value. But it's the fact that it has some value other than money, a money value, is what makes it significant. Now, yet the issue here is not really uh, what money is. The issue here is what is the growth in value of money? What determines the growth in value? Obviously, it does not lie in the, in the so-called paper money, in whatever form the paper is. Nor does it really lie in the terms of platinum or gold and silver and so forth. So where's the, where's the value lie? Well, the value lies in the, in the case of humanity. And animals have a certain kind of value. Uh, 
better growth, better quality, so forth. But as human beings, the creativity and value lies in the mind. It lies in the a actions of the mind. And now I give you some, a material to work, produce, metallic material or some other kind of material. And what makes it increase in value over what it was the year before or the year before then? The actual value, if you measure it by any physical standard or any standard of comparison of the quality of life and so forth, all these things. And it has nothing to do really with money intrinsically. Nothing at all. So what's the problem? What's the root? What's the mistake? The mistake lies in the fact that we don't, people generally, including leading economists, especially leading economists, have, haven't the clearest idea in the world, not the, the simply clearest idea in the world, none, on what makes value in money. Now, some people can get a correlative, can explain that this happens, that, that happens, this happens, and they can say, well, this is an increase in the value of something. Why do we consider something of interest in value? Why was the Massachusetts Bay Colony more progressive in terms of economy than the, than the England, which is supposed to be the power over the, over the uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony? Well, it's because they were more intelligent. As a matter of fact, the greatest achievements of England came as a result of Benjamin Franklin's visits during the course of the early 18th century. He taught them how to make coal, how to make the, the vacant function, how to deal with iron and other kinds of things. And the English, suddenly some of them, learned how to produce things on a modern basis, or for that time a modern basis. But without Benjamin Franklin, and without the Winthrops and Mathers before Franklin, none of this would have happened in that, in that period. So we got crushed a little bit because the British Empire em emerged during that early part of the 18th century. And then, but then the British, with a physical political, physical power, were able to subordinate us. But nonetheless, because something about us, whenever we had the chance, we as would always beat the British in terms of rate of improvement. And that could be the case still today. And so the, prob the problem is that people try to assume that the exchange of labor, the exchange of this, the exchange of that, somehow has an intrinsic uh, value as a cause of improvement of the physical conditions of life and intellectual conditions of life of humanity. So the idea, when people are talking about monetary policy, monetary policy as such has no intrinsic value. What has value is the power of a human mind to create a method or create a creator design which increases the value of the productive efforts of a human being or a group of human beings. And therefore, when we talk about money or monetary things, or talk, we talk about money from the standpoint of an accountant, the accountant, as an accountant, has no idea what the hell he's doing in the terms of economy. He may be a, a smart accountant, but it's not as an accountant that he's actually increasing the value of his product. And so we, we have now, we've got to realize now that our problem is that the greenies, the greenies are not the only problem we have, but they typify the problem. The existence of the human race, the existence of all living species, depends in some way or, not, or another, depends upon the increase of the produ productivity or the equivalent of productivity of that species' behavior. Huh? That's not, it's not a matter of money. An accountant can't give you a higher, an increase in productivity. Can't do it by accounting practice. 
the accountant can contemplate what was done by some other means, but they can't do it by, by accounting methods, by sitting there with numbers and figures and playing with them. It doesn't do anything. So this is our problem, that people, in, in the, particularly for the greeny phenomenon, which came on in the United States and in Europe, the idea of value today, and especially increasingly since the assassination of uh, Kennedy, President Kennedy, there has been some development, the, for example, the space program, other technological improvements, but it was not, it was not the, uh, the money side of the thing that made the growth where it occurred. What made it was something else. The creative powers equipped tantamount to scientific creativity. That is what produces wealth. Now, what did we do in the aftermath of several things like what happened after the, this war in India China? We have, it, it, except for certain scientific programs, in general, we in the United States have lost our productivity factor. We are worth less today than we were, our ancestors were, a couple of generations back. And so when we talk about money, we talk about monetary policy, what it, we shouldn't be talking about monetary policy as such. We can talk about monetary policy as an, a, fit, a footprint, but not the motion of the foot. The footprint, what you want to know is what made the footprint. You didn't want to take the, the footprint to bed with you. And, and so th this is our greatest problem now, is that we have lost the connection as a nation. And I speak as a nation. Lo we've lost the connection to reality, to any actual economic reality. We now, we now want more. We would like to have more. We would like to feel more comfortable. We would like to be better fed. But the things we're doing and have been doing since Jack Kennedy was murdered, the trend has been, despite the space program, despite those things which have been progress, the trend overall per capita of the productive powers of labor have been on the downslide. And that's our problem. That is the problem that got us here because of government and similar kinds of policies that brought us here. And also, the, the effect of that kind of policy made us, in general, more stupid. Less, most people are not employed in producing anything except spiritual experiences or something. So there's no, there is no real understanding. So we've come to this point. Europe and the United States for example, are now in a period of hyperinflationary explosion. That's what's happening. That's what's happening in the United States. And it's just a matter of a moment, almost any day now, you have an explosion of hyperinflation under Obama. As long as Obama remains president, in effect, we are in hyperinflation and it's going to carry us down to destruction. Only taking Obama out of the presidency, which can be done by impeachment process, and there's plenty of evidence on which to apply that. Throw this bum out of office, send him someplace where he won't annoy people, you know, and we can have a chance. But we're going to have to change the policy. And so what we have is a pro this pro problem. We in the United States, through partly of what our small organization is doing, and the factor that we are we represent in terms of increasing an understanding of how to build, rebuild this economy and how to correct the errors that are destroying us. We, have, we represent that. There are a, a whole layer of people in the United States who are highly skilled in this matter, who understand what an economy actually does. Their understanding may not be perfect, it may be inadequate, but they are capable of, of exerting their mental powers to produce that effect. Now, we can do that, and we must do it. And the reason I say what I've just been saying is that we in the United States must not worry in, for, for the moment 
about whether Europe is going to solve its problem or not. We may be concerned, morally concerned, but we're not going to be hampered by, the, by any failures of Europe to do what it should do in the same way we should do it. We do not believe, and the evidence is, there is no way in which all of the nations of Western and Central Europe could have an equal rate of productivity. It's just not possible. So the idea of the euro was an insane conception because you have nations which have different characteristics of economic progress, real economic progress, and that you try to run them together on a single policy, destroy their sovereignty, destroy their identity, and you are destroying their productivity. Each nation is different, and therefore you have to recognize their traditional difference as nations, as sovereign nations, respect their, restore their sovereignty, because if they don't have sovereignty, they don't have the power to control their ability to produce. You cannot impose, arbitrarily impose the, a, a rate of productivity on them. They're different. They should have the same productivity, but they don't now, because the, the structure of the, what had been these nations has very significant differences in their ability to produce. And also the, the character of what they can produce effectively is not the same for among these nations. So we have to recognize their differences. The United States is actually a superior cap has a superior capability historically for progress, for growth. And therefore, what we have to do now, to, to come to my point here, what we have to do now, we have to, for a moment, forget everything else in terms of making our policy. We are the United States. We are now working in a milieu, our organization is working in a milieu, which is part of our government, the people who compose our, our government, who are not in the government necessarily, but we're, we all work together. We are, we are determined to work together. So let us look only at what we, the United States, have to do right now. What we have to do with our potential productivity, how to bring it back into functioning. Well, we've lost it now. The greatest danger we have, especially in Europe and in the United States, the greatest danger we have is the greenie policy. If, and this, if you tr do go to a green policy in terms of economy, in terms of productivity, you will destroy the human species. The green policy is, is a dive downward in productivity. As long as we have a green policy dominating the United States, as it has increasingly since the middle of the 1960s, we are, we are doomed. We've reached, reached that point largely because of the influence of the green policy on the United States economy. And a similar thing has been going on in Europe. We are degenerating. We are self-doomed unless we change our direction. We have to grasp what the prin physical principle of productivity is. To go back to high technology approaches in every respect, in every aspect of our technology. We have to go, first we have to go, the, we the United States must charge ahead for the moment on our own. In these weeks now, because it's in these weeks now that the survival or destruction of the United States will occur. And it will occur on the basis of whether or not we are, go are again a productive nation. Because if we're not a productive nation, all the fantasies about paper money and similar kinds of fakery don't mean a thing except that you're wasting your time when you're in a desperate state of affairs. So we in the United States must launch a high-technology-driven program of progress. We must, for example, launch NWAPA. For example, explain what NWAPA means. The NWAPA pro program is a unique program. It covers in immediately most of the western areas of the United States, of part of Canada and Mexico. 
This is a water system. Now, we can increase the productivity of water and its byproducts. We can increase it by probably about 70%. By, the, by this, it's not going to happen at once. It can be done in two generations, in 40 years. We could make that, and we can increase the rate. So we can produce more water in terms of effect than we consume because water is circulates through the United States, the total territory, and Canada, uh, going up into Alaska and out of Mexico. So we, when we, we uh, use the water, or the water is used, it doesn't go away. Not exactly. What it does, it goes as moisture and becomes new rainfall. And this, what we have done as a mistake in recent times in our agricultural policy, we have had a water policy which, where MOAPA should have been applied. What we've been doing, the land area in the central plains of the United States has been subsiding. And that's one of the reasons for the problem, the great problem we have. We don't have a high-tech uh, water management system in which we circulate the moisture, which falls once as rainfall, then as evaporation goes back to new cloud results, comes back with more rainfall so that you get up to 1.7 times the amount of moisture that you would think from the rate of rainfall you get. You're reusing the same moisture several times in the course of its transport across the, across the territory of the United States. We also have to, in other ways, increase the physical productivity of mankind in the same way. We need certain large projects which will develop our nation. We must do this immediately. Uh, then we, the next step then is to say, turn to our friends in Europe and elsewhere and say, you see what our policy is. Isn't, isn't it the policy that you need to? Why don't you use the example we are presenting to you so that you can enjoy the be same kind of benefits we're seeking for ourselves? And that's the way we have to think. We have to think in terms of the prin physical principles of economy in these terms, not in terms of paper money, not in terms... No accountant can ever create reality for you by bookkeeping. Somebody has to do something. Somebody has to make a physical improvement of something. And it's that physical improvement done by high-skilled people, more and more skilled people, scientifically trained people, and others, which increase the productive powers of labor. The condition of mankind could never be improved except by the policy I've just stated. That is the history of mankind in one, one way or the other. And the going back backward to the green policy is actually a route toward the extinction of the human species. So that's the subject which I want you to keep in our minds for this hour or so. Thank you. Um, on that note, we move into our dialogue period of this live webcast, and uh, I would like to ask Jason Ross to come to the podium uh, to both pose a question and to uh, fill in some of the developments that have occurred this week, uh, which point in the direction of an increased understanding of what you've been saying tonight. So on the, uh, on the subject of money, because this is being discussed quite a bit, with the fiscal cliff and the debt ceiling pushback somewhat, and Obama playing hardball, threatening that he might cut Social Security checks, etc., even though Social Security isn't funded out of the general budget of the U.S. Um, in this context, there is a lot of discussion. Some experts or self-minted experts have proposed the idea of minting platinum coins with a very large face value 
to deposit on the Federal Reserve to get money is a way of sidestepping the entire fiscal cliff and the debt ceiling to make money available to the U.S. as a form of script creation. And while there does need to be a, a serious discussion about the creation of credit, uh, it seems unlikely that such showy means would work without the fuller understanding of what the credit would be directed to and, uh, and how it would be made. On the whole fiscal cliff discussion, Paul Craig Roberts, the Reagan-era Treasury official, he had written recently in an article about the fiscal cliff. He says that, forget the fiscal cliff, the issue is the derivatives bubble, the derivatives tsunami. He wrote, uh, quote, he wrote, the derivatives tsunami is the result of a handful, a handful of fools and corrupt public officials who deregulated the U.S. financial system. Today, merely four U.S. banks have derivative exposure equal to 3.3 times the world gross domestic product. When I was a U.S. Treasury official, he says, such a possibility would have been considered beyond science fiction. So as discussed by Roberts, the purpose of the ongoing bailouts has been to maintain the value of the debts held by the banks, to maintain the value of this paper. Uh, while under the banking reorganization under FDR, the RFC insisted on writing down assets to whatever their actual values were, which is not happening right now. So if the values aren't written down, you can create money all you want, and that process will never reverse. You're just going to have hyperinflation. So although the banks might not like it, they're going to have to get cut off. Let me read you two recent statements just in the past couple of days about Glass-Steagall and, uh, and then ask you a question. Start with two days ago, uh, Dallas, the president of the Dallas Fed, Richard Fisher, he delivered a speech where he called for an end to the protection of too big to fail banks. He said that only commercial banking operations should benefit from the safety net of the FDIC and the Fed's discount window. And he said that there should be a warning on non-covered banking activity after the banks are split, like what you find on a cigarette carton. He said it should be something like, warning, conducting business with this affiliate of the bank holding company carries no federal insurance or other federal government protection or guarantees. I, fill in the blank, fully understand that in conducting business with blank banking affiliate, I have no federal deposit insurance or other federal government protection or guarantees, and my investment is totally at risk. So that's how it ought to be. Uh, yesterday, Thomas Honig, the former Fed president from Kansas City and currently the vice chairman of the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance uh, Corporation, he wrote in The American Banker that the way to resolve too big to fail is to remove the safety net of insurance of non-banking activities. Without Glass-Steagall, Honig wrote that if the, blanks, if the banks were split today, that without a government backstop, the market would demand stronger capital and safer asset growth. This, in turn, would enhance the ability to place them into bankruptcy instead of the arms of the taxpayer, should they run into trouble. So my question to you is, how would Glass-Steagall change or obviate entirely the whole discussion of the fiscal cliff right now? Well, you can't answer the question in those terms alone. The question, the question of productivity is, is, is the key issue here, which I ref just referred to. And without that increase in productivity and certain restrictions, uh, it's not possible. But what you've outlined is exactly for the competent economist would agree. And an economist who wouldn't agree ain't competent. <laughs> and I've, unfortunately, we have incompetence is, gets the highest favorable treatment by this president, for example. The more incompetent you are, the more he likes you or w wants to eat you, perhaps. He thinks you're tasty or something. But anyway, that's, that's essentially it. There, there is no uh, alternative. The basis of wealth is based on productivity relevant to the human species. Now, relevant to the human species means all the other things that go together with the achievement of the human species. Every form of animal life that we maintain, 
and which is a greatly beneficial to us, is of that nature. There, uh, crops, the, you, vegetable crops, for example, the same thing. They don't have much of an intention. They have an effective way of functioning, but they're, they're useful. And we, have, we know the rate of in, increase of the physical usefulness. And the key thing in this is you've got to think in terms of physical science, not accounting. Um, accounting is what you bring in to say when, the, the, when you're going to go bankrupt. When you're about to go bankrupt or you're engaging in practices that are going to drive you bankrupt, that's the time you need an accountant. N not to advise you what to do, but to advise you what not to do. And if you don't obey, he should dump you. So the point is we, what we have to get back to is realizing that there is no such thing as a, a monetary theory as such. A monetary theory does not exist as a, a competent item. What exists is science, and science is expressed in many ways. But the key thing about science is that it's produced only by the mind of human beings. And it's when the mind of the human being is applied to solving the challenge of how to increase the productive powers of labor, physical productive powers of labor, or the benefits that go in that manner, that's science. And the, the accountant is not, by, uh, as an accountant, is not a good judge of how to get to the future. The accountant is like the undertaker. He'll get, make sure you're buried competently if you don't do the right thing. And so his value is a sort of mostly a negative one of what not to do. But it, the, the, what is required is the creative powers of mankind to increase the potential productivity of the human mind is the development of the human mind and it all can be d broken down to a standard of physical science and it's only physical science that can actually measure that aspect of human behavior which corresponds to human progress okay well I have a question um, on what you just brought up uh, during your opening on this question of uh, physical, the what you called the principle of productivity. Because you were talking about uh, the productivity of a rainfall where um, with a project like NOAPA, you have it uh, recycled essentially in the biosphere. Um, it, and the rain on its own is an expression of the abiotic, but then when touched and harnessed by man, uh, we increase the productivity of it. So um, what I want to ask you to do is to kind of expand this relationship between man and the biosphere on this question of the deep principle of, of productivity in the context of the NOAPA 21 program, which oh. is you know, biospheric engineering. Oh. Yeah. Well, go back. Say, so what's the difference between man and beast? What's the well, element of difference? Fire. Only mankind is the only species that effectively employs fire. Now we go from, you know, if the archaeologist gets into this thing, he finds a place where the, a fireplace was made. And that tells you whether the thing was a, an ape of some sort or whether it was a human being. That goes way back as far as we know. So human beings are always creative. And the standard of creativity is how to control the use of fire. It's not just the use of fire. You can set a forest fire in place. That's not really an achievement. But the point is to increase the productivity of mankind, physical productivity, by means of aid of such as fire. And that's the one thing we have from the archaeologists can determine something about a culture. Only when you've got a fireside culture and some other artifacts which go with that sort of thing. And that's how you can dig back into South Africa, deep areas of South Africa, and determine that it was man, not a monkey, not a gorilla, or something like that that made it. 
So is this, is this capability of mankind? Now, how do we measure progress? We measure progress in terms of the relative energy flux density of the medium employed as power to change the physical process. I presumably improve it. To burn something down, to build it up. We go from, from uh, burning trash, bushes, things like that. We go then to chemical sources, which in, increase their energy flux density. And it's the increase of energy flux density which determines the increase of the productivity of the human species, and even de determines whether the human species is qualified to survive. Now, it goes to one layer. You go up to all the way through the various kinds of things you burn, boil, and so forth. Then you get to nuclear, nuclear power. Now, nuclear power is a natural power. That is, we use, we uh, get it from, say, from uranium, uh, things like that. So we, we, that takes us into a new dimension. But then you go into another dimension, thermonuclear power. Thermonuclear power is something which is a man-made thing, instrument for mankind. When mankind uses it, it's that form. Then you go to what you go to there. You we're going then to, eventually to what we call matter antimatter reactions, a concept which was developed by the great Einstein this discovery. So it's the increase of the energy flux density going from the primitive caveman's fireside up through the various stages of higher and higher orders of energy flux density that is measured in terms of per capita, per cross-section of area of, of, of applied. And that's what, that's what the thing is. Everything we do in terms of building machinery and using machinery and so forth is based on this process of the organization of energy flux density, both in order to create the instruments of, of progress and to create the progress itself. Hmm? And that's what anything else is nonsense. Now, of course, one aspect goes in this is mankind is not, is not limited to where he starts from in this process. Mankind develops the human mind to levels which the human species had not achieved earlier. So the, the most important product of human creativity is the development of higher degrees of human creativity per se. And if you have that attitude and that approach, then you may fail to achieve your intention, but you have not failed in the choice of attention. Attention. Good. Okay. Um, so. I'm going to uh, switch gears a little bit. I uh, have a question about Algeria and, and Mali, what's really going on there. We've had a, um, a hostage situation there uh, with, um, and the, the Algerians sent in special forces to try and resolve that. And it's not quite clear what the outcome has been, except for the fact that uh, it uh, didn't set well with Cameron nor Obama that the Algerians themselves intervened in the situation. Now, um, the the hostage situation was a premeditated and planned out attack by a group uh, reportedly around uh, Mokhtar Bel Mokhtar, okay. um, which has docu he has documented <clears throat> connections with the same Al Qaeda which carried out 9/11 at Benghazi. Um, now we're going to be putting this in our updated fact sheet, uh, adding this material which we've been distributing widely in D.C. and um, so. One question is, you know, if you didn't have the stonewalling of the Benghazi investigation, um, perhaps we could have forestalled uh, the elements which would go into this operation, uh, but we have had Obama stonewalling uh, on the thing. But the broader question is, when 9-11 at Benghazi first happened, your assessment was that this is not just a single event but the beginning of something which would spread mm -hmm. throughout the region. 
And that's exactly what we've been seeing. Um, so beyond the surface level, what is it that's driving this? And because um, a question that some people have is whether this is a new attempt to destabilize, destabilize the world at large. Well, there are two, two answers that have to be brought together on this one. Uh, first of all, uh, this whole thing is intentional. It, the process is an extension of the British Empire. That's where the whole thing begins. If you don't start with the British Empire in particular, you have no idea of what really is, first of all, not only what the result is going to be, but what, what it, uh, why and what the effects on all mankind are from our allowing the Bush, President Bush, Junior Bush, uh, to get by with suppressing the evidence, the known evidence. And now it's not officially knowable because the Bush family put the lid on, on, on the, these, this evidence. Uh, the op but we know and the evidence is there and the proof is there that 9-11 of 2001 was organized by a trio of factors. Number one, first factor, was the British monarchy. Number two was the Saudi monarchy, which is an extension, as part of the British imperial monarchy. Hmm? And the intention is to bring about a general destruction of the human species by decimating it, by going to thermonuclear war and similar kinds of warfare, which the Queen has made clear. The, her policy is stated clearly to reduce the population of the planet from what had been, a few years ago, seven billion people living to one billion people living, or approximately that. That's the intention. And the intention is to use nuclear weapons and to use the terrorism, the Islamic terrorism and other forms of terrorism, and to use that as an instrument of warfare which combined with, in other words, the effect is where is this going? Why would people want to do that? Why would the British monarchy want to do that? Why would other people wish to do that? But for what reason? To drive the world to a new world war um, and to be now to do that you have to bring in the kind of war they intend you have to bring in a certain factor and that factor is includes thermonuclear weaponry that's the intention now you see in Russia and you see in the Joint Chiefs of Staff under the last presidency uh, under president the current presidency's president's uh, presidency the intention is is heading toward a thermonuclear war in some degree and the what the nightmare is the that we if we start this thing the united states is the only nation which has the capability now to do a thorough job in launching a thermonuclear war other nations have ca this capability in part, but they don't have a part for a global warfare. So therefore, the, the chiefly the U.S. Navy, with its, its capabilities in thermonuclear weapons, is obviously then be, being drawn upon as the choice that the President Obama would like to use. So uh, both, both the Bush administration and the Obama administration put a prohibition on the revelation of the information which was known to the investigation of the original 9-11. And Obama and the Bush family are guilty of a, well, the greatest crime against humanity which has ever been presented as an actual capability at this time. Now what you're seeing therefore, you see an operation of creating chaos 
And the, the main weapon is chaos. And remember, the Saudi kingdom and the British monarchy and the f same firm, BAE, that was used for the weaponry and the use of the oil from Saudi Arabia, which was used to fund this whole operation, which became not only 9-11, but the whole operation that we're seeing now as in Algeria. The personnel, everything is, is essentially the same pattern. And the problem is that we have a population in which people do not believe that they can forecast the future. They believe that it only happens to them. That there's not a willful factor in the, this process. There is a willful factor. The, this, the creation of this system, this threat of thermonuclear warfare, the way it's being organized now, is based on the assumption of nothing that exists only in the future. And it's the inability of the typical stupid American, and I do say stupid American because this, you've got to use that word stupid, not to recognize that hum, the uh, characteristic of the human species is the ability to create new conditions and to willfully create new conditions re to create conditions that never existed before or never existed in that form before and used before. And that the issue is that. The issue is the stupidity of people who don't realize what the meaning is of what the Queen of England has pushed on her part and what her government has done, her empire has done, in conjunction with the Saudi empire. And if you look at this process, the core of this thing is all, is all that factor. What you're seeing is the future. And you're telling it to people who don't believe there's a, there's, you can know the future. Well, I can know the future, and other people can know the future. Every, every scientist who creates a discovery has created it out of the future. Every great weapon is a creation out of the future. Every great achievement is out of the future. It's a willful intention to reach a point in the future. And that is the difference between the human being and the monkey. I would like to stick with that theme, but I've got, there's just been a number of questions coming in. I want to take up uh, another theme about impeachment, which, you know, has been sort of taken on a, a new direction recently with what Obama did with his executive orders regarding uh, gun control, where uh, a number of congressmen have come out. Like, there's a discussion in the Congress now about impeachment. It's not like a strange idea anymore. In particular, Steve Stockman has discussed impeachment pointing out the difference between an executive order about, you know, the executive branch of government versus writing legislation for the entire country. That, you know, if something where the debate is about what are, what are the implications of the Second Amendment, that's not something for the president to just write an executive order about without going to Congress or discussing with the courts, etc. So um, that it, it's, it's raising that as a serious issue. On another issue, the... Uh, Confirmation of Brennan as uh, Obama's choice to direct the CIA, that's brought up the whole drone issue. Is, uh, Brennan is intimately involved with uh, the kill list, you know, Obama's kill parties. And uh, I just want to read you a quote. This is uh, Senator Wyden sent a letter to Brennan with some of his uh, questions about, uh, about the, way, the way the CIA has been operating, specifically on the use of lethal force against American citizens. Now, uh, here's what he wrote. Uh, part of it, he says, the senator says, as I have noted before, individual Americans generally do not expect to know every detail about sensitive military and intelligence operations, but voters absolutely have a need and a right to understand the boundaries of what is and is not permitted under the law so that they can debate what should and should not be legal and ratify or reject decisions that elected officials make on their behalf. And I believe that every American has the right to know when their government believes it is allowed to kill them. 
I think that's a commonly held belief. Um, you know, he reminds he reminds uh, Brennan that the United States Constitution states that no American may be, quote, deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, which I think does not only involve the executive branch. I Just one more uh, quote here about, uh, this is a, an article in the New York Times by Vicki Dival, or Dival, sorry if I said your name wrong. She wrote that President Obama has refused to tell Congress or the American people why he believes the Constitution gives or fails to deny him the authority to secretly target and kill Americans who he suspects are involved in terrorist activities overseas. So far, he has killed three that we know of. And she goes on. But I'd, I'd like to ask you, what do you think the... Um, this is good news, the discussion about impeachment uh, being being brought up more. What could you say about the use of drones and what Obama's doing? <laughs> well, first of all, you have to say, take the, take the accusations that are made uh, as a pretext for these executions it, it, against American citizens and others. Um, and the principle is there. So the, principle is, the principle is what's the key issue, not how many people were killed in this problem, but what the principle is. And the principle, you know, first of all, the war that, the war that has, Obama has been involved in has been a violation of the Constitution, everything he's done. First of all, he does not have the power to make law on his own. The Constitution prohibits that. But he's done it. He's done it repeatedly. When you also have, you have two presidents who as presidents are guilty of this crime. They have committed crimes, murderous crimes. And they've done it with, on their own, own authority. So the issue here is the same thing as the Adolf Hitler question. Now, I've been raising the Adolf Hitler question as a warning concerning Obama's presidency since the first year of his term. And it came on the same issue that it came for Hitler. The first crime, social crime, that the Hitler regime created was the health care reform of the same thing that the British are doing now and did. So this this very action is a crime against humanity. There can be no justification for it. I mean, the only justification for it is war. In other words, the only time you have the right to kill people of another nation is when it's an act of war. And therefore, we... But the point is, as we saw in the Libya case, huh, that Obama violated the Constitution on exactly this same category of, of thing, evidence. It took the lives of people huh, in, in Libya, huh, and he took their lives. Did he, have a, did he have the authorization to do that? Did he have the authorization to make a shooting war? No. But he and the British did it. And they were doing it in the case of 9-11. What was the meaning of 9-11? Why would the Saudis and the British Queen huh, be conjoined, as we know is the truth of the matter, in launching this atrocity? So, obviously, Brennan knows this too. He's a criminal, just for what he's done. The, the president himself is a criminal. He's violated the Constitution on a fundamental term. And only by intimidation has he uh, obtained the consent of citizens, including high-ranking citizens, members of the Senate, members of the judiciary. They all know this crime has been committed. It's a violation of the Constitution. It's a crime against humanity at the same time. These men belong, you know where. They belong in Nuremberg.
Well, um, that brings a conclusion to the questions that we have uh, brought in tonight. But I will say that uh, the activity that the LaRouche PAC is engaged in, in Washington, D.C. in particular and around the country, is focused on precisely the two themes that you addressed tonight, the Hitler nature of the Obama presidency uh, and also the immediate necessity of the United States taking the lead to roll back the 50-year paradigm since the death of JFK to return to the essential American system economic principles as is contained in the three steps of our program uh, as you have documented it. Uh, so what I would say is in conclusion for ton uh, with tonight's webcast, we have a lot of work to do. I will make the point that there is an increased attention on uh, Glass-Steagall and on the Marcy Capture bill, but also, ironically, the very day following uh, Obama's uh, inauguration next Monday, Hillary Clinton will be appearing in front of f first the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and then the House Foreign Affairs Committee. And the questions are uh, there. We've put them out in our fact sheet. And uh, the question of whether or not the follow through will take place um, to make that the beginning of the political end of Obama's regime uh, is yet to be seen. So I thank you all for watching tonight. Uh, and. I urge you to return to Mr. LaRouche's opening remarks and study them carefully. The uh, principles which he is addressing tonight uh, are essential for our organizing over the coming week. Thank you very much, and that brings a conclusion to tonight's webcast.